Good afternoon, distinguished guests, faculty, students, and friends. It is my distinct honor to welcome all of you to the 2023 Constitution Day Forum. My name is Saktiram Kumar, and I am the Master of Ceremonies for today's event. Today, we celebrate the 236th anniversary of the United States Constitution. In doing so, it is an honor to welcome distinguished members of our faculty, Professor Atiba Ellis, who is the Laura B. Chisholm Distinguished Research Scholar and Professor of Law at CWRU School of Law, and Professor Jonathan Enthen, the David L. Brennan Professor Emeritus of Law at the CWRU School of Law. Professor Ellis is here today to discuss, after Allen, the end of racial gerrymandering. To our guests and to our audience, the Society for Constitutional Policy appreciates your time sharing your thoughts on the questions at the heart of the future of our democracy. At this time, I would like to remind all first year students as part of the Explorer program to please scan the QR code as they are leaving this event. Without further ado, please allow me to introduce our moderator and society president, Ms. Kelly Mellon. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, as Mr. Kumar reminded us yesterday, Sunday, September 17th, we celebrated the 236th anniversary of the signing of the United States Constitution. Needless to say, much has happened since then that has grabbed headlines and continues to shape our lives. Let's now journey to Alabama. On November 4th, 2021, Alabama Governor Kay Ivey signed into law a new congressional map that redrew boundaries for the state's seven districts in the House of Representatives in Washington. The map included only one majority black district, despite the, the fact that African Americans compose more than a fourth, just over 27%, of the state's population. Civil rights advocates quickly contested the redrawn congressional map claiming that it violated Section 2 of the 1965 Voting Rights Act by diluting the voting power of Alabama's black population. In January 2022, a panel of three federal judges determined that Alabama's map violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. The state of Alabama then accelerated the case, Allen v. Milligan, to the Supreme Court to answer a key question. Did Alabama's 2021 redistricting plan dilute black voting power and therefore violate the Voting Rights Act. This past June, the Supreme Court in a five to four decision struck down Alabama's congressional map on the grounds that it violated section two of the Voting Rights Act by diminishing black voting power. This decision had an immediate impact and Alabama was required to draw a new map true to the state's demographic makeup. The larger implications of this decision remain to be seen but with similar cases on dockets across the country, the impact of Allen v. Milligan will be evident soon. However, Alabama is not taking this defeat easily. For example, the same US District Court, which rejected the first map, recently considered the legislature's revised effort and found it to be inconsistent with the Supreme Court's recommendations as it still handicaps black voting power. The Supreme Court ordered lawmakers to create a second majority black district or quote, something quite close. Republicans who have a supermajority in their legislature are testing that formulation. Their proposed map still only has one majority black district and reluctantly increases the share of black voters in a second district to just under 40%. It all but ensures that Alabama will continue to send six Republicans to the House of Representatives in a state where black voters continue to tend to prefer Democrats. Republicans hailed this plan as a compromise, but the district court certainly saw it differently. Today, we are honored to welcome Professor Atiba R. Ellis, who earned his JD from Duke University. Professor Ellis is a nationally respected voting rights scholar. His primary research focuses on the interaction between racial oppression and class-based oppression, and how communities on the margins of American democracy are denied their constitutionally protected rights. His wide-ranging interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary work spans doctrinal legal analysis, critical political theory, race and the law, legal history, and innovative legal pedagogy. Professor Ellis's work has analyzed the socioeconomic effects of voter identification laws, the disenfranchisement of felons, 
the scope of the Citizens United decision, and the ideological drivers of vote suppression. Our own Professor Jonathan Enton will join Professor Ellis as discussant. Thank you both for being with us here today. We would now like to introduce to you our student panelists. Please join me in welcoming our student panelists, Mr. Christopher Batarse, Ms. Catherine Feng, and Mr. Jonah Ledet. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. All right, Professor Ellis, the floor is yours. I have to start with an admission, though. I heard the introductory comments, and I thought, wow, why do you need me? You, you hit all the highlights. Um, but there is a middle between thinking about this being the day we recognize the 236th um, commemoration of the signing of the United States Constitution and where we are today as a democracy. And so my goal here is to sort of fill in that story, at least as much as I can get in in about 25 or so minutes, and, and end with a discussion of Allen and its consequences. So I've titled my talk here, if this thing will move, I didn't title it Atiba R. Ellis. Um, I titled it Race, Color, Blindness, and Democracy, Alan V. Milligan and Representation in America's Third Century. And I called it this because Alan's holding in both that Alabama's district violates Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act and its consequences which are extraordinary for their normality. That is, that Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, as it's applied to vote dilution claims, still remains constitutional. And indeed, Chief Justice Roberts went to great lengths to say, and I think the money quote from the opinion was, you know, we decline Alabama's invitation to rewrite our Voting Rights Act jurisprudence. D despite the fact that the dissents wanted to take up that invitation in varying ways, but we'll get to that. The fact that this is an extraordinary opinion for its lack of extraordinariness, that finding Alabama violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act uh, is in line with similar litigation that has taken place in Georgia, Louisiana, North Carolina, Texas. It's been, it's been, it's extraordinary for its consistentness. And its consistentness is weird because the same justice a decade earlier struck down section 4B of the Voting Rights Act, the part that was the trigger for the pre-clearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act. And we'll talk about the two components of the Voting Rights Act in the course of our conversation, but suffice it to say here that where, when, this, when the invitation was extended to me in the spring and prior to when I, Helen was decided, I thought I was going to be giving a lecture about the death of the Voting Rights Act. Not quite. But out the Allen opinion read in the history of race and democracy in this country opens up a number of questions that I think we can have a rich conversation around. So, this is how I want to proceed. I want to talk first about race and the, what I like to call the politics of worthiness in America. And then, as I've hinted at, I'll discuss the structure of the Voting Rights Act and then I'll talk about gerrymandering, because I'm not going to necessarily assume that everyone spends every day reading law review articles and keeping up with the news around gerrymandering. So a few basics to set up the Allen v. Milligan conversation and to help shed light on answering the question of, well, if Alabama's entitled seven congressional districts, why does the Voting Rights Act, as interpreted by a three-judge court, lead us to the conclusion that Alabama ought to be entitled something close to two majority black districts? And even that question itself, and where I hope 
to end our conversation throws open a lot of concerns. Concerns around whether race ought to be consciously thought of as one of the many factors that are thought of around redistricting, whether we might envision a post-racial future, especially given the Supreme Court in other areas has said explicitly that universities cannot use race because that directly bends the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Um, you know, there, there are tensions here, tensions that I would also want to situate in the fact that America as an entire country will become, the, its majority will be of folks who are considered minority. And read through that light, the challenge offered by the Allen litigation and the report and Implications of what Alabama is doing raises the idea that the color line, to quote Du Bois, might not have ended the 20th century in due course. So let me start with what I mean by the politics of worthiness. I speak, when I speak of the politics of worthiness, I mean the belief that inclusion into the political community must be measured on some measure of identity and that some identities deserve inclusion rather than others. It's a cycle of exclusion, right? It is a cycle of exclusion as old as the Constitution that we celebrate today. And in fact, is arguably built into that Constitution. And the dynamic that I want to talk about, and I drew a little graph here. The dynamic I want to talk about, and in the Q&A we can talk about the meaning of these blocks on the chart, but what I often frame as sort of my animating scholarly approach is this idea that there's ideological persuasion that convinces people that some folks are worthy and others are not at least worthy of inclusion into the political community. And because of that dynamic, laws get built that legitimize exclusion and therefore create boundaries. And almost in some papers I wrote way back when in that critical political theory stuff, creates tiers of legal personhood. And, and yet folks who recognize their autonomy and believe in their equality push back against that. And so inclusion gets affirmed by the creation of new laws. But then the ideological persuasion rises again in a different guise and the cycle repeats. I think that the conversation that has led us to Alan V. Milligan is representative of that cycle. Let me explain. So, Let's start with the right to vote before the Civil War and let's get to the founding document. That constitution that we're celebrating today had built into it several structures that define the way elections happen in America. Interestingly enough, none of these structures created a direct rule about how voting was supposed to take place. If you look at the original Constitution, there is no statement of a right to vote. Only with Reconstruction comes the phrase the right to vote as an object to which we apply anti-discrimination principles. But the original Constitution in the Elections Clause suggests that the electors for members of the House of Representatives will be the people who have the same qualifications as the voters, in essence, in each state. In other words, the states get to set the rules. The Elections Clause, the Electors Clause both share this language. The Constitution itself doesn't define who gets to vote, who gets to participate, but the Constitution does define the idea that there is to be reapportionment and that reapportionment ought to be done in terms of the whole number of persons 
plus three-fifths of persons who are in bondage, who are in slavery, if you will, even though the Constitution does not itself say slavery. But the point is that the three-fifths compromise the whole idea that the southern states get power by counting the number of enslaved persons as part of the census population around which we draw our population and then divide up into representative districts. In a sense, this is the original gerrymander. And this is built into the Constitution. So this challenge around race and voting has, is as old as the Constitution itself. Now, interestingly enough, the franchise and slavery are intertwined conceptually because in most states around the turn of the 19th century, the original franchise limitation was property ownership and slaves counted as property. So if you could demonstrate that you had sufficient property, you could vote. And the electoral districts were shaped by the slave population as well as the free male enfranchised population. Free white male, I should say. But interestingly enough, historians have pointed out that formal voting restrictions in regards to race didn't exist at the beginning of the 19th century, but racial voter intimidation did. And as universal white male suffrage w grew, it developed on the backs of explicit African-American exclusion from the franchise. So that by the 1850s, with the coming of opinions like Judd Scott and the passage of fr franchisement laws virtually across the United States, African-Americans were effectively excluded from the American political community. It took the Civil War and Reconstruction to undo this. And in the interest of time, I'll allude to the Reconstruction Amendments. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment defined citizenship and defined the idea that all persons in the United States are entitled to the equal protection of the laws. That is, no law can be passed for an arbitrary reason that, for our purposes, is designed to work discrimination. And the 14th Amendment also has embedded the first provision in the Constitution that directly addresses voting because it creates a penalty in section two around states who attempt to disenfranchise mass blocks of their population. It says, in essence, states will lose representation to the extent that they wrongfully disenfranchise. Now, with the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment, there's a caveat to all that, which is that unless you've been convicted of a crime, and the implication, of course, which the court recognized the century later in Richardson v. Ramirez, was that felon disenfranchisement was perfectly permissible under the Constitution. That ought to be the subject of another talk, another day. But for our purposes, free black voting tremendously changed the South during Reconstruction. From members of Congress to local officials, African Americans across the South were able to participate in their government until Reconstruction ended. And during the era of, well, actually, even with the coming of Reconstruction came voter intimidation, the uses and threats of violence and intimidation. And then with the Jim Crow laws that were passed, poll taxes, literacy tests, understanding tests, grandfather clauses, voter intimidation, as I mentioned, the use of violence to chase people away from the polls, and indeed the extra legal lynching, and arguably not extra legal in as much as there were many a conspiracy between the government and the lynch mobs. This was an era of violence. And in the Jim Crow South, 
The intention to quote some disenfranchisers was to make the government of the Jim Crow South a white man's government. Not to let the North off the hook, by the way, because what was explicit there was often implicit in practices and the use of tactics to segregate African-Americans and then limit their power. Now, I put up this map for Gamerlian v. Lightfoot because it's the first move by the modern I should say the Warren era Supreme Court to address a lot of this violence. Now I am going to save discussion of that for my colleague, but this is also the hint that redistricting plays a part of this, not just the explicit violence, but redistricting as well. Now all of this was addressed by the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965 after the violence of Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama. But that is the capstone of decades of activism and not just the era of Martin Luther King, but all the way back to the turn of the 20th century. For example, the NAACP was founded in 1909, and at the top of its agenda was addressing voting rights issues. But we have the signing of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, because the country became acutely aware of the violence and bloodshed around race and voting, and the political pressure became sufficient so that Lyndon B. Johnson ends up passing the act. And you can see Martin Luther King Jr. there standing behind him. Now the Voting Rights Act contained two primary provisions. Section 2, which we'll discuss in detail in a little bit, and Section 5, which I alluded to earlier. But to put it in one place, Section 5 was designed to capture bad actors and say states who have violated the law and who have lagging rates of participation between the majority and the minority racial groups, you are under supervision. Section two basically encodes what the 15th Amendment promised of no discrimination in voting on the basis of race. And I note too the National Voter Registration Act and the Help of America Vote Act, which also helped spawn voter participation across the United States. Our modern era in terms of participation, and of course, is one where on its face in most places you can vote freely today. But this was an effort centuries in the making. Now of course, Shelby County v. Holder struck down that section five that I just alluded to. And part of what Section 5 did was to check laws to prevent discrimination before the discrimination could happen. By supervision, I meant the state had to offer the law to the Department of Justice to get it approved. If the Je Department of Justice approved, fine. If they didn't, then you had to take it to court. And the question in those laws was, did the law make minority voters worse off? Now, after Shelby County v. Holder struck down Section 5 in 2013, there was a rash of litigation, some of which was about states like North Carolina and in North Carolina and AACP versus McCrory using voting laws to target people of color and their preferences. And similar accusations were made in Veasley v. Abbott. I mentioned Brnovich here versus Democratic National Committee because there the court interpreted Section 2 to vote denial claims, i.e. there is some law that gets in the way of you personally being able to vote. But what we want to focus on here is not vote denial, but vote dilution. Assuming that you can participate in elections as an individual, how much is your vote worth? And is your vote 
diluted in relation to other districts where the same vote's being cast? This is the question of gerrymandering. I put this under a broader rubric of representation distortion because the whole idea is that even though you get to participate, your ability to participate is based upon the idea that my vote will be worth the same as other votes. It takes the same amount of group power, groups getting to vote together to elect a candidate in one district as it should in the other. And so in that way, representation is more than just your individual ability to participate, but it is also the notion that groups can come together to seek the representation they wish to have and that their voice will be effective. Gerrymandering then, by playing with maps to either put people in the same group together or break that group up so that in the same district the group doesn't have the representation it could have is a problem. Now there are other forms of distortion not part of our discourse today. We can talk about that in the Q&A, but let's focus in on gerrymandering. Now here's a little chart to help explain it. I ripped this off from the Washington Post for educational purposes only, for the record. So if we imagine a district with, here in the first slide, 60% blue, 40% red, and everybody lives in these blocks, and we have 50 people and we want to draw five districts. Gerrymandering is all about how you draw the lines. So we can draw a line that gives perfect representation to each of these five groups. We have five districts that are 100% blue, or three of them are blue, two are red. We can draw a district that's compact. The districts have the same regular shape, but they are drawn so that blue has a majority in each of the five districts unfair and the result of course in these two districts is that blue wins or we could draw lines and kind of zigzag in a way to make sure that at least the majority of the districts red has the majority and so even though there are three red districts and two blue districts red wins even though red is only 40 percent of the population this is the problem of gerrymandering. How do you draw the maps in order to create advantage? So there are some core ideas. One person, one vote. This whole notion that districts have to be equally sized. It used not to be the case that every district had to be roughly the same size until the court in a series of cases in the 60s said, Districts have to be the same size because it's not areas that vote, it's not land that votes, it's people. So you need the same number of people in order to vote. And, and, we've, and, so, and I'll hint briefly that one way we can group is partisan gerrymandering, worth another talk in and of itself. But the short of it is, sometimes the groups are political parties. What we want to focus on, though, is racial vote dilution. And there are two main theories. There's racial gerrymandering, and in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the gerrymandering basics and just get us to gerrymandering and race. But if you keep that in line, you know, red and blue can be political party groups, it can be racial groups. So let's talk about it. There are two theories. One is racial gerrymandering. The court, in 1993, in a case called Shaw v. Reno, said there is this notion that a district could be drawn so with such a lack of compactness. It can be so weird and strangely drawn, and you can see the ma maps from 1993 here. It can be so strangely drawn that it's clear that race was the predominant concern around drawing the map. And in essence, if you use race to such an extreme, that violates the Constitution. Now there are a variety of factors to take into account when drawing maps. Political party, incumbent protection, 
local alliances, communities of interest, city and county borders. The court is saying, well, if race becomes the number one factor, that violates the Constitution. The other idea is racial vote dilution under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. That theory is drawn from Section 2, which, and you can see the text here, but the highlights are that if there is a voting practice that results in the denial or abridgment of the right of any citizen to vote on account of race or color, that violates the statute. How do you figure that out? You figure that out by looking at a totality of the circumstances to see whether the political processes are, in essence, un open or less open to minority groups. But, and this line at the bottom takes us directly to Milligan. Nothing in this section establishes a right to have members of a protected class elected in numbers equal to their proportion in the population. Now, how do you figure that out? Well, when the statute was passed, there was a number of Senate factors which stress the history and structures that teach whether we have an understanding of how race and its history have affected the way maps are drawn. And this leads us to a case called Thornburg v. Jingles. This was the first test of this Section 2, and this is, was all amended in 1982. Jingles comes several years later. North Carolina is accused of using multi-member districts to shut out African-American voters from electing the people they wish to elect. The court finds that North Carolina's contested districts are mostly in violation of Section 2, and they establish this test to articulate it. The Jingles test first asks for whether the group is large enough and geographically compact to constitute a majority in a single member district. So can we imagine a district where we could have a majority? Two, does that minority group vote in a politically cohesive way? And if so, are their interests routinely defeated by the racial majority. So Allen is in essence simply an application of the Jingles test. Like I said, it was unremarkable because this has been litigation that has gone on for over three decades. And Alabama was caught Ill, in violation. So you can see the heat map here on the right is the density of the African-American population and the districts on the left are what Alabama had passed. And the idea is that Alabama's African-American population, that two districts that they could numerically have, got, they got one district, but the other district got broken up into several others. So, did it violate the Voting Rights Act? The court says yes. And the court in particular says, Alabama's theory that this is legal is inappropriate for the Voting Rights Act in as much as, Chief Justice John Roberts speaking, Alabama seeks to basically discard paying attention to race as Jingles mandates. In essence, Alabama's argument was, hey, we ran big data, and we ran a, a simulations that came up with the districts that we drew, and we, in essence, did not code for race. We ran these districts, and because, and in that sense, race didn't affect the drawing of these districts, and therefore, now I'm gonna make the timekeeper mad because I'm gonna go over about two minutes, so apologies. But the short of it is, Alabama said, we have this approach. It did not implicate race, and therefore, that ought to pass muster under the Voting Rights Act. But the court basically said, no, we meant what we said in this test, and we're not going to take the bait of rewriting the test on your rationale. It actually is supposed to be race conscious in this sense, and we hold to that standard. 
Now, I know that the Q&A will in part talk about the details in the dissents, but the short of it is the dissenters basically, you know, Justice Thomas said, none of this is really constitutional from the get-go. And we can talk about why he says that in detail. And Justice Alito says, well, I accept the premise of the Jingles test, but the thing is, we're misinterpreting the Jingles test. And so in my interpretation, what Alabama has done is perfectly fine. Remember, G Alito wrote Brnovich, which interpreted for the first time vote denial claims. So the take home here is that race conscious vote dilution as a theory still stands today in that sort of how you draw the boxes way of thinking about gerrymandering, race can be taken into account. What the court has told us is that you can take race into account, you can't use your use of race in a way that denies or abridges the right to vote by impermissibly gerrymandering on the basis of race, but you neither can so affirmatively have race in the forefront in your mind that you violate the 14th Amendment in Shaw. So the status quo reigns. Now whether that status quo is appropriate for our third century that is diversifying on the other one hand, but concerns of minoritarian tyranny are being spoken of on the other, well, I have more slides, but I think we can just get into that in the Q&A. Thank you for your time, and I will yield to my colleague. Thank you, Professor Ellis. The first thing I want to do is apologize for holding up the program, and I will try to get us back on schedule. Um, I should say it is a, a great honor for me to be part of this program. Uh, I always learn things from Professor Ellis, and today is no exception. Um, could I ask you to put the Tuskegee map yeah. back up there? Uh, because I'm going to come to that I uh, put shortly. it there for you. Thank you. Um, before I get there, um, let me just pick up on a couple of things that Professor Ellis mentioned to try to, to underscore the points. Um, First, with respect to the 14th Amendment and the, and the uh, reduction in congressional representation to states that, that deny voting rights, um, it is important to keep in mind that the 14th Amendment says the denial of male voting rights, um, and that was a source of controversy at the time. Uh, it effectively made necessary the, the ratification of the 19th Amendment down the road, although women were generally not allowed to vote uh, in 1868 anyway. Um, second, I want to talk a little bit about what the Supreme Court has been doing with the Voting Rights Act. Professor Ellis mentioned Shelby County. Um, he was tactful enough not to point out that Within days of the Supreme Court's ruling in Shelby County, which eviscerated the preclearance mechanism in Section 5 that said covered jurisdictions had to get federal approval before they changed their voting rules. Within days, some of the states that had been covered under the old formula adopted really draconian voting restrictions, uh, which I think pretty much undercut Chief Justice Roberts' claim in the majority opinion that, well, the world has changed since 1965 when that formula was adopted. Also, with respect to Brnovich, um, Professor Ellis notes that Justice Alito wrote the opinion. It's an important Section 2 case, and Justice Alito and the majority of the court en uh, engrafted some elements to prove in a Section 2 case that are not in the text of Section 2 and will make it down the road um, difficult, more difficult for Section 2 claims to prevail. Now, also with respect to representation, 
In the United States, we operate with single member districts. That is not the only way that we could district multi-member legislative bodies. Um, that raises all sorts of interesting questions. We also operate under a first-past-the-post system so that the, the candidate who gets the largest number of votes wins even if uh, that person does not necessarily have an absolute majority of all the votes cast. Um, and there are some other ways that we could do uh, our system. Um, we might go to a more general system of runoffs. We might go to a system of proportional representation. Uh, we might go to ranked choice voting. Those are all interesting questions that we can, uh, that we can get into. And the last point that I want to pick up on from Professor Ellis is the notion that under the one person, one vote rules, that districts have to have equal population. Fair enough, but there is still the question, which population are we talking about? Are we talking about all of the people who live in an area, which is generally the way we do things now? Or is it voting age population, which we do for certain purposes? Or is it citizen voting age population, which has been a proposal in some states with large numbers of non-citizens? Those are all basically issues uh, that could consume us for, for days, each of them, and I don't, wanna, I don't really want to go there. I do, however, want to take a few minutes to talk about the case of Gamillion against Lightfoot, and I want to talk about Gamillion against Lightfoot for two reasons. Number one, it is a foundational case, maybe the foundational racial gerrymandering case, uh, and it's worth talking about for that reason. Secondly, there is a case Western Reserve connection uh, to, to, to uh, a Gamillion against Lightfoot. The case was argued by our probably most distinguished law school graduate, Fred Gray. Um, and uh, by the way, Mr. Gray is still actively practicing law uh, at the age of 92. Um, so, uh, so there's hope. There's hope. Now, and by the way, for the, since we are limited in time, if you're interested in more about Mr. Gray, the Case Western Reserve Law Review has a special issue honoring Mr. Gray's work that appeared in 2017, and I encourage you to take a look at it. Okay, so, Gamillion. Gamillion against Lightfoot ruled unconstitutional a classic racial gerrymander. Um, these maps tell the story. Before the city limits were redrawn, um, Tuskegee was shaped roughly like a square on the left. After the map, the borders were redrawn, um, Justice Frankfurter described the, the shaded area on the right uh, as an uncouth 28-sided figure. Um, Mr. Gray, uh, in his complaint, described the new city limits as um, a sea dragon. In any event, um, how did we get there? Well, it turns out, as Professor Ellis pointed out, that for most of the century after the end of Reconstruction, uh, Alabama systematically prevented blacks from voting. Tuskegee turned out to be a bit of an exception because there were two important institutions there that drew a large, a relatively large number of black professionals. One was Tuskegee Institute. Uh, the other was a veterans administration hospital that was created after the First World War to serve only black veterans. And over time, uh, it, it became possible for enough black voters to get on the rolls in Tuskegee that blacks actually were the, the deciding factor in local elections where the white vote was divided. Well, in the 50s, uh, as, as this became clearer, um, other things were going on. Brown against Board of Education, for example, came down in 1954. And then there were some closer Alabama connections. In 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give her up her seat on the bus. Uh, and she was, by the way, represented by Mr. Gray. Um, 
that launched the Montgomery bus boycott. The following year, a federal court ordered the first black student to be admitted to the University of Alabama. So at that point, the resistors, the white resistors in Alabama were really, really angry. And they decided that they were going to uh, take revenge on the f black folks in Tuskegee, whom they regarded as being somehow behind a lot of the civil rights activism. This map, the redrawn map, removed 99% of the black voters from the city of Tuskegee, and not a single white. Mr. Gray represented Charles Gamillion, a Tuskegee Institute sociology professor who had been uh, active in getting black voters registered. Uh, they filed a class action. Um, long story short, the case failed in the lower courts, uh, and it failed in the lower courts despite the fact that some of the judges who sat in the case uh, had really, really strong civil rights records. Uh, Frank Johnson, the district judge in Montgomery, John Minor Wisdom, a legendary uh, Fifth Circuit judge. Um, but they ruled against this case because there were some pretty large legal obstacles. Number one, the Supreme Court in a series of cases um, said that states have virtually unfettered authority to regulate their political subdivisions. That might have meant unfettered authority to redraw the city limits. Second, to the extent that this is a, a case arising on voting rights claims, it wasn't entirely clear that the plaintiffs had completely lost their voting rights. True, they couldn't vote in city elections in Tuskegee because they no longer lived in the city, but they could still vote in state elections and federal elections, so that was a challenge. The third problem was that the Supreme Court had said in a case called Colgrove against Green back in 1946 that basically cases involving districting were not fit for judicial resolution. So there were lots of challenges. But by the time the case got to the Supreme Court, Mr. Gray went up to, uh, Mr. Gray decided, he, was, he brought these maps with him. He put them on an easel as he started. And he was, uh, and he said that was a calculated gamble because he said, you know, he was expecting Justice Frankfurter, who was a stickler for procedure and jurisdiction and who had written Colgrove against Green to complain that the maps weren't in the record. If you ever have a chance to listen to the recording of the oral argument, you'll, you'll hear that Mr. Gray was not even a minute into his argument when Justice Frankfurter piped up and Mr. Gray says his heart sank because he, he thought he knew what Frankfurter was going to ask. Well, it turns out Justice Frankfurter asked Mr. Gray, uh, where is Tuskegee Institute on this map? And uh, Mr. Gray pointed out that Tuskegee Institute was, you can see, it was outside the city limits in the northwest corner of the old, the old map. And the next thing you hear is Justice Frankfurter uh, incredulously saying, what, Tuskegee Institute is not in the city of Tuskegee? Well, anyway, um, the case was for all practical purposes over at that point. And Justice Frankfurter wound up writing a unanimous decision saying that if the plaintiffs could prove their allegations. It would be a virtual, virtually mathematical demonstration of a constitutional violation. And so that is essentially what happened in the, uh, in the lower courts. Um, that's why Tuskegee is back to looking like the square, not the uncouth 28-sided figure. But I think we should, and we should note that Today, to this day, Gamillion is the foundational racial gerrymandering case, but it's more than that, and we should appreciate it for that reason that goes to what we're talking about today. Baker against Carr, which established the one person, one vote rule, was decided less than 16 months after Gamillion was decided, and the court relied on Gamillion in Baker against Carr, which set in motion a whole series of cases 
down the road. Um, it also matters to the constitutionality of, general, of gerrymandering more generally. Um, now, in 2019, the Supreme Court said that claims of partisan gerrymandering are not fit for resolution by the federal courts. But Gamillion established, and the court continues to say, that claims of racial gerrymandering are. As Professor Ellis pointed out, Allen against Milligan is a Voting Rights Act case, not a constitutional case. There is a case that's going to be argued on October 11th alleging a, an unconstitutional racial gerrymander in South Carolina, and the state is defending that case by saying, we don't, we're not gerrymandering on the basis of race, we're gerrymandering on the basis of partisan affiliation. Well, it turns out that in South Carolina, as in Alabama and some other states, it's really hard to tell the difference between party and race because whites vote overwhelmingly for Republicans and blacks vote overwhelmingly for Democrats. So we'll see where we wind up here, but Allen against Milligan doesn't, doesn't directly uh, resolve these things. Now, um, we should go back to thinking about, well, where do we go from here? And you see this in the dissents, some of the dissents in Allen against Milligan. To the extent the dissenters say that, that the Voting Rights Act requires attention to race, it's unconstitutional because the Constitution makes race an illegitimate basis for decision making. That's not what the court said in Allen against Milligan for a variety of reasons. Allen against Milligan is a, is a somewhat fragile precedent. As Professor Ellis says, it's five to four. It was a ruling on a preliminary, uh, at a preliminary stage of the case. The case is now going back to the Supreme Court. Five to four ruling. The fifth vote comes from Justice Kavanaugh. Justice Kavanaugh made clear that he was really ambivalent about the idea of considering race in redistricting. I think it's unlikely that he's going to change his mind in this case, but I think it is entirely possible that he will change his mind somewhere before too long, in which case we're going to have some real challenges uh, dealing with uh, Voting Rights Act claims of gerrymandering. Uh, and depending on how the court looks at the consideration of race more generally, it seems to me that we might be seeing more claims of unconstitutional racial gerrymandering when the point of the districting is to enhance black representation uh, rather than to deny it. Thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Remarks. We are going to go ahead now with our panelist questions. Um, so, who wants to go first? Professor Ellis, Allen v. Milligan has had repercussions for districting commissions across the country. Several states have begun revising their electoral districts to conform with the Supreme Court's decision. Will Allen v. Milligan have any impact on Ohio's electoral districting? Well, I don't think that, in the short term, at least, there is any sort of Voting Rights Act specific issue that will be confronted in Ohio. But I think it's fair to note that, um, one, and I gathered some of the data here, that a number of states are dealing with these issues. I think that there are, just looking at congressional races, right, I think that there's somewhere on the order of, I want to say seven, I, I wrote all these notes and now I can't find them. Um, but yeah, there are a number of states, Louisiana specifically, and 
several other states where there are several, several congressional districts in question. And thinking broadly about the sort of consequences of Allen, given that it basically says the jingles test status quo is to be maintained, and assuming that similar courts make these similar decisions, then, and given what per, my colleague had said about how black voters tend to vote heavily Democratic, there are those who are forecasting that by Allen being decided the way it's been decided, it could very well tip the House of Representatives in the next election cycle. I, I won't in a room with political scientists in it, I won't do any prognostication about that, but suffice it to say that commentators have been making that point. Could I just pick up on the Ohio connection? Mm. Um, Ohio has never been a covered jurisdiction under the Voting Rights Act, but that by itself isn't dispositive. I mean, it is, it is possible that there could be claims that uh, Ohio legislative or congressional districts violate the Voting Rights Act because, because of the, the, the jingles test. But Ohio has a lot of other redistricting controversies that are not related to the Voting Rights Act uh, that, that have to do with the system by which uh, the Ohio Constitution calls for the redrawing of, of legislative and congressional districts. Uh, and without beating this into the ground, last year the Ohio Supreme Court struck down five legislative maps and two congressional maps. Um, and um, there, there is going to be ongoing litigation uh, about some of that. Uh, there is also a proposal to amend the Ohio Constitution yet again to go to an independent redistricting commission. Those are really interesting subjects, but for another day. And, and to be clear, um, when Professor Enton says covered jurisdiction, that is the nomenclature of Section 5 which has been out of operation for a decade now. And, but this gets us back to Merrill simply because, and, and the through line between both of our co comments is that Alabama had this history, and, and by the way, this is my opportunity to talk about Giles, right? In what scholars look at as probably the most nefarious voting rights case ever. There's this case called Giles v. Harris, which came out of Alabama in 1903. Jackson W. Giles alleged that he, as an African-American man, was literate and could pass the literacy test, was employed and could pay his poll taxes, could do all the things on that list of things that I showed you earlier. And yet Alabama is effectively conspiring to keep him and all other African-American men off the polls as much as they could. The court, in an Oliver Wendell Holmes opinion, basically said, well, look, if, if you're asking us to change these laws because of this conspiracy, that would mean that we're participating in the conspiracy, and that would be illegal. If you're saying these laws are unconstitutional, then there's nothing here for us to do. Either way, the case is dismissed. And oh, by the way, if Alabama wants black people to vote, let the voters of Alabama decide that, or the legislature. It, the mendacity of the opinion is such that scholars point to it as the high water mark of the court of an era that refused to help black people vote. It's sort of the high water mark of Jim Crow. This is the same Alabama. The Alabama of Gomillion, the Alabama of Giles, the Alabama of Milligan. Just to make the point. I know you have more questions, sorry to. The key question in Shaw v. Reno is the constitutionality of drawing a district with the name of achieving a more diverse pool of congressional representatives. Professor Ellis, does Allen v. Milligan challenge the court's ruling in Shaw? In short, it does not. So there are two theories, just to be clear, this is something I alluded to, but now I'll make it explicit. 
Shaw is based on the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. And I hinted at the idea of equal protection. You can't treat different groups differently in a way that's irrational or discriminatory. The whole reasoning in Shaw was you're overusing race to the point that it becomes constitutionally offensive in what some scholars kind of refer to as, I know it when I see it reasoning. It is, oh, let me get back to that Shaw map. Um, in other words, the map in Shaw was such that, there it is. There, this offended the Constitution by an overly race intentional map drawing. Milligan, on the other hand, says, in section two says, you can't discriminate in a way that takes away voting opportunities from African Americans, or any racial minority, I should say. And so the two don't contradict each other, but as a practice in regarding to redistricting, they basically set the guardrails to protect against discrimination. One thing we ought, to, we ought to note about this, if this had been a partisan gerrymander, and by the way, a number of, of states had congressional, Pennsylvania was a, a good example, uh, had congressional districts that had pretty bizarre shapes, but they were partisan gerrymanders, not racial gerrymanders, and so they're not subject to challenge in a federal court. But um, we also should note that Shaw against Reno is is one of a number of cases in which the Supreme Court has found an impermissible racial gerrymander uh, where the district lines were drawn for the purpose of promoting black representation. But not all of the cases of this sort have failed. In fact, the most recent Supreme Court ruling on, on North Carolina 12 actually upheld the district uh, a few years back. Um, By the but, way, I pulled up I happen to have the Moore v. Harper slides. So this is what North Carolina looks like, partisan gerrymander. If you remember the Shaw slide, that blue spot is right. largely one of those districts from Shaw. Right, okay. But again, I think the, I think the key point is that, that some justices, the dissenters in, in Allen against Milligan, do see, I think, some tension mm -hmm. between cases like Shaw against Reno and the Voting Rights Act. But at this point, at least, a majority of the court, a narrow majority of the court, isn't prepared to say that. But I think we can take the, the, the narrow vote in Allen and the, and Justice Kavanaugh's ambivalence as suggesting that there may be a time before too many years pass where we will see that the court says that there is a big tension between Shaw against Reno and those sorts of cases uh, and the Voting Rights Act. All right. Professor Ellis, in an interview earlier this year with Vox, you stated, quote, in some ways, the way the Voting Rights Act has changed has been, in part, a conversation between Congress and the Supreme Court, end quote. What do you mean by that? So, y'all listen to my podcast. Hey, um, let us go back to section two. The, and in fact, Alan V. Milligan sort of uploads this point, but there is history to it. The reason why this last sentence is there, as Justice, as the Chief put in his majority opinion, is because there was a compromise in Congress to on the one hand codify protecting and enabling minority participation in voting, 
But on the other hand, there is this deep concern, and this actually gets back to some of the points Professor Enton was just making. There's this deep concern about the act being one that guarantees some form of proportional representation based on race, right? And you can certainly hear it in what Justice Thomas says in his dissent in Allen. I know we'll talk about that in a little bit, but the heart here is how do you protect without becoming racially you know, to use a phrase that Justice Scalia used at one point, without it becoming a, quote, racial entitlement. And, and the heart of the conservative objection is if we are doling out political power on the basis of race, that violates what the 14th Amendment was supposed to do in the first place. Now, this entire amendment happened because in a case called Mobile versus Bolden, Mobile, Alabama, versus Bolden, the Supreme Court of the United States said the 15th Amendment could only be used if you find evidence of um, intentional discrimination, right? You need on the record someone saying that their intent was to discriminate on the basis of race in voting, or as we saw in North Carolina NAACP versus McCrory in 2016, you can use circumstantial evidence to create the strong inference of intentional discrimination. So in a sense, the court said that in 1980. Two years later, Congress amends the statute to make the Voting Rights Act a viable alternative to the 15th Amendment. The problem with putting an intent standard on using the 15th Amendment, and we've seen this in the 14th Amendment as well, is that no one is going to be so stupid as to explicitly say what their racist intent is. Intentional, evidence of intentional discrimination is almost impossible to find. And so the statute shifted the statute is about the results of laws, not what people intended when they passed the law. And as a compromise to worry about the sort of racial essentializing point, the law nonetheless is meant to not guarantee some sort of proportional racial representation. This was the dialogue going on between the court and Congress in the 80s. Shelby County is another version of the dialogue with a different result, but that's the point that I was raising then. And just to come back to the intent point, um, Gomillion against Lightfoot, nobody actually said in so many words, we want to disenfranchise black voters in Tuskegee. But you look at what they did, right? They removed virtually every single black voter from the city limits and not a single white. And the Supreme Court has said in some cases that say you have to show a discriminatory purpose. Well, even if you don't have the proverbial smoking gun, if you have a situation like Gamillion against Lightfoot, that'll do. But of course, anybody who's at all sophisticated will realize that you don't want to be that perfect, right? You there, There's a question about sort of how, mu how much imperfection is allowed, right? But that's the problem with having to show a discriminatory purpose as opposed to a, a significantly disproportionate impact. All right, so we are running out of time. Um, I Hitting a 10 minute left in our program today, so we would love to open up to audience questions. If anybody in the audience has a question, anybody at all? Yes, I will take it. I was gonna see if there's any students before I hand it off to Professor Wayne. <laughs> Perfect. Well, just one comment on, first of all, on, on religious discrimination. It turned out that there actually was somebody stupid enough to say explicitly what he wanted to do, and he got kicked, and he got knocked down by the Supreme Court back in 2017. Um, but, but separate from that, um, uh, there's this tension 
in that if you in in that a lot of the uh, heavily black distorted districts would were, have been in the past drawn in order to pack black voters into districts and therefore reduce democratic representation. That's certainly part of what was going on in, in, in North Carolina. They didn't do that uh, down, down I-85 in order to uh, make sure they had two black districts. They did it in order to get as many black voters as possible out of the other, di out of the other districts so that, so that the Republicans would have uh, the most control. And um, I guess the question that puzzles me is if something like the districts in Chavi Reno is not legit, which certainly shouldn't be, um, what is how what what is the alternative that the court is thinking about in Allen v. Milligan? In other words, if you had to write districts to design districts like the ones in Chavi Reno, in order to get two black representatives from Alabama. Would they have said you you can't do that? In well, other words, does does the decision in Allen v. Milligan depend on basically a, a a distribution of the population such that you could sort of write you know design districts without trying so hard to get to black majority districts? I, I Professor Ellis, you get back to this map. I mean, I think one answer is. The, the distribution of population in Alabama doesn't require that kind of, of, of manipulation of the district lines. And the Supreme Court hasn't given us a real standard for saying that this much racial consideration is too much, right? This is the Justice Stewart uh, notion, right? I know it when I see it. He was talking about obscenity, but I think uh, in many ways, I think the cases, and Professor Ellis, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the, the racial gerrymander cases, a lot of these cases, look a lot like the I know it when I see it standard. I think you alluded to that yes, in your opening I comments. I, I think that's right. Uh, yeah, you don't have to work that hard in Alabama, given its distribution and its history, where you might have to do so in North Carolina, where there's far more population around urban areas aside from sort of the North Tidewater corner. I grew up in North Carolina and in some of those places. Um, yeah, come, uh, if I can go backwards, yeah. Anyway, you get the point that, like, the 12th starts in Durham, ends in Charlotte, and picks up the cities where in Alabama you don't have to do that kind of work if you look at the sort of heat map version of this map. There is a lot of compactness. I have another answer, though, to that question. I think Chief Justice, if you ask Chief Justice Roberts that question, I think his answer is all of this turns on the fact that it doesn't necessarily require X number of districts in ratio to Y percentage of the population. He's, the first part of the opinion goes at length to lay out that history of why the, the 1982 amendments came to be to make very clear that this is not about per se per proportionality. And I think the court would eschew any such version. I, I suspect that he would not been a, have been able to get Kavanaugh's vote had written something that hinted at that way. And Kavanaugh, as we have already alluded to, is quite ambivalent about the larger prospect of the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act. The whole notion of kind of proportionality and, 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 and this gets us to Justice Thomas's dissent. Part of his dissent is making the point that, well, actually, there is no way around it. And, and, and his view is that there is no sort of legitimate way to harmonize a kind of balancing act that the act seems to be carrying out and the language of the act. And so he has argued, in fact, since Holder v. Hall in 1994, that Voting Rights Act racial dilution jurisprudence is 
unconstitutional ab initio because this kind of use you know, bleeds into his larger view that any governmental use of race is immoral. I have big issues with that, but that's his view. Other questions? Yes, you have it. Perfect. And this might be our last question, unfortunately. I'm um, interested in what you have to say about uh, if we go from this kind of gerrymandering to urban versus rural is another method. And does that point to we have to go to a, another voting method, like Professor Enton said, in order to resolve the whole issue? Well, I think that, I mean, a lot of the partisan charge, first of all, is urban versus rural, to sort of put it broadly. You look at Ohio, look at many states. Um, I think doing it differently would require reconsideration of the one person, one vote doctrine, right? And so, which is foundational in regards to how all of this works. In fact, prior to Baker v. Carr, there was what could be called urban rural gerrymandering in the sense that, I think what, it came out of Tennessee. Um, you had big blocks of rural voters represented in a small number of districts or versus a, an urban district or two. And so we lived through that era, but one person, one vote came up explicitly to get rid of that. Also, by the way, there are racial dimensions to that as well, if you stop and think about it, right? But the point being, in a lot of ways, there's a lot of resistance to sort of reinventing reform, and the proposals Professor Enton pointed out, in essence, are more about not the size of the districts, but how the votes get counted, and the short of it is, a lot of the polarization that we see from a two-party system might get moderated if we go into some other approach. And there's more incentive for more parties, and, and I'm at risk of treading into political science space. I, I am of the view that our two-party system in America is probably, in any other country, would be at least six parties. Right, um, but anyway, the point being, there, there are incentives for single member district in post, first past the post rules, right? It's very easy to protect incumbents. It's very easy, and I don't need to tell political scientists this, right? It's the tradition and the law has grown up to protect that. So as much as it might help moderate concerns, you're asking the folks who benefit from it to change the thing they benefit from, and I'll go and drink a martini and wait for that to happen. I don't have anything to add, so. Well, um, for the interest of time, we have, we'll, we'll ask one more question. Um, we would love to see a student ask a question, um, if any students have any questions. Now is your chance. By the way, if this uh, is ever of interest and if you ever are interested in law school, I teach election law every year. So it's, and we can get into all the nuances that we can't do in an hour and 15 minutes. Hi. So, um, I guess a question that I have regards like what would be the opposite of a situation like this? I'm from Chica the Chicago area um, and there was a district within the 2012 to 2022 um, cycle which included a large African American neighborhood on the north side of Chicago and a large neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. They were connected through the map by an interstate which no one lives at the interstate. Um, Obviously, the court in this situation has declared that Alabama has violated the Voting Rights Act such that um, they have disenfranchised, is not the right word, but enabled 
a map that doesn't allow for proper representation of the state's African American population. Has the court ever weighed in on, you know, a situation where there has been a racial gerrymander to enact a minority majority district? Um, and has the court ever struck a district such like that down? So, what's interesting, there are several layers here that I'll run through really quickly. To my mind, the dynamics of the issues that tend to get to the Supreme Court have tended to be folks who present as white on the one hand and folks who present as black or Latinx usually on the other. And in those sorts of dynamics, that's sort of the tradition against which the Supreme Court jurisprudence has been written. Now, if you go into the lower courts, it's far more diverse. And if you look particularly at Voting Rights Act and even Shaw-type gerrymanders, you see more of that in you know, local government districting or state legislative districting and that sort of thing. So to offer you another example um, of municipal districting. So I taught um, at Marquette up until this year um, and in the south side of Milwaukee, there was substantial amount of population growth and the Latinx community had grown and some city council people argued that there should be a, an additional district that was majority Latino. And the city had created a whole plan to do this and that plan forestalled. I wasn't at the meeting, I only heard about it. But the short of it was the city attorney explained Shaw v. Reno and Jingles to the city council. And then after that, the city council stopped that plan, much to the public ire of the three Latino representatives in the like 24 um, member common council. Um, I think that you're going to see more of that sort of thing, like stuff that happened in LA um, around districting made national press a few years back where, for example, I think it was the council president and a couple of the influential members who were all people of color were sitting here basically conspiring and caught on tape about how to basically impermissibly racially gerrymander the alderman districts in LA. Um, and in some ways, this gets back to the point of it's all just politics. Um, and, and politics might have certain correlations with race, but then again, people who want to protect power want to protect power, and they use whatever means they can get away with to do that. Um, but one other point that your point brings up, right, is that simply, with the diversification of America, I alluded at the beginning of my comments that America was going to become majority people of color. Um, but in many of the major cities in the United States, you already see that, Chicago, LA, Milwaukee, others. Um, and these politics are going to play out. If we wanna talk about what's next, this larger question of how do multiracial politics play out in a doctrine that is created against the black-white binary, and what tensions will that evoke? And I get to say this at the very end of the talk, so I don't have to explain what I mean, but maybe that's another lecture. Um, but your question speaks to that kind of concern, which would make me think that those cases will ultimately make it to the Supreme Court down the road. There's been some coalition district among minority group stuff that's come to the court, but the sort of flip the script kind of litigation is in the offing, but it will happen. Let me just raise the, the contrast again between racial gerrymandering and partisan gerrymandering. Um, 
the Supreme Court says that we don't have manageable standards to to resolve the legality of partisan gerrymandering. But this question and a lot of what what Professor Ellis has been saying suggests that we don't necessarily have great standards for determining racial gerrymandering either. And so then we are kind of left with the question, do we throw up our hands, as the Supreme Court did with respect to partisan gerrymandering, uh, or do we try to craft imperfect standards that may lead to a degree of inconsistency in results, uh, which is kind of where we have gotten with racial gerrymandering, and as Professor Ellis suggests, that with the increasing diversification of our population, those issues may get more complicated as well. Uh, but we still are back to the question, so do we throw up our hands and say, this is too complicated for judges, or do we say we shouldn't trust the politicians to operate in an unchecked way? And I, I'll just simply say, I mean, that is an interesting point. It will get explored. But I, at bottom, I think the expectation of the distribution of political power, especially among communities of colors, is, is such that throwing up our hands might have an unintended consequences that people would not want to reckon no, with. I'm, I'm not advocating. I'm simply saying oh, no, no. the options are, right? I, I, I'm not putting it in your voice. I'm just saying there are those who say that, but it is in and of itself a Pandora's box. Now stop there. Ladies and gentlemen, the Society for Constitutional Policy would like to express its sincere gratitude to Professor Ellis and Professor Enton for joining us today. We give special thanks to the Office of the President and the Provost for their support. We would also like to give thanks to our many contributors, the School of Law, the Department of Political Science, the Center for Policy Studies, our student panelists, moderator, timers, and volunteers, and our wonderful advisors, Dr. Dahl, Professor Lucker, Professor Tartikoff, and Dr. White. Thank you, and we wish you a great rest of your day.